Watch that you say C L A S S ever again unless I really mean it. So, but you understand. Good. You are new proteges, fellows, protege. Protege is a term we use when we work with a mentor. We used to use the term mentee. That's not a very sophisticated term. Protege is a term that's used as a professional. It really indicates uh, your role uh, as a partner in the process of um, uh, improving and working on excellent teaching. So you have all been assigned a mentor that you've met or not met? Yeah. We've met your mentor. mentor. Okay. And we're going to, re and the mentor's coming in tomorrow, while you're in class, to mentor, most of you, are, uh, uh, the mentors are going to be here, we're going to uh, mentor the mentors as to their <laughs> responsibilities. But I want you to be clear as to the responsibilities. So the very first part of this uh, is to review with you some of the responsibilities uh, uh, of the protege mentor relationship. And it is, research indicates that when new teachers have a mentor that is supportive and the school structure provides that structural support, you are more likely to succeed in teaching. Most teachers nationally, whether it's private schools or public schools, last three years. Research says that when there's a protege relationship, that at least doubles, if not quadru uh, quadruples, the retention rate of teachers. Most of us, when I taught in the last century, uh, I began teaching in the last century, um, it was sink or swim mentality. There was no support. Teaching is a lonely craft. And I, you know, mostly sank that first year. I wish, I wish. I could redo that first year. Right now, there's somebody, however old they are, mm -hmm. saying that Mr. Glanz, uh, mm -hmm. you know, some lousy teacher. And we make mistakes. With a mentor, there is less of a chance to do that. Less of a chance to do that. So really, your responsibility is to utilize that mentor as best you can. So. Uh, The technology here is that the the mouse is connected. This one slot, and I gotta change back to this. Okay, so hopefully this will work. Okay, I'll take a second. And there it does. There you go. Okay. So here's a quote. Unfortunately, there's a perception out there that teaching is easy. And it looks easy, and basically people think you can do, that. You can do teaching. Anybody, anybody can teach without much preparation. And it's a misnomer. Uh, and it's outright wrong. It takes between five and seven years to become a really good teacher. Can anyone teach? Maybe. You know, you can't say, can anyone do, you know, uh, dental surgery? Right? Mm -hmm. But can they teach? Yeah. But well and right? Not many. It takes practice. It takes professional training. There's certainly the, the art aspect of teaching, your personality, your charisma, etc., so forth. There's also a science. There are certain do's and don'ts that, that are, are, necessary, are part and parcel of the teaching process. And that's, that's, that, that's a part of today's session, instructional tips that we'll go over as well to talk about. But teaching is certainly complex, and it's so fast moving. In a class of 15, 17, 20 students, third graders or 12th graders, or in, and in between, uh, so many things are happening at the same time. Classroom management issues, checking for understanding issues, bathroom issues, uh, uh, interpersonal issues with students. That makes teaching, so not just simply 
teaching content. It's really much more than that. I asked you for a second to jot down your definition of teaching. Please do that. Jot down, someone's going to ask you, define teaching. What would you say? Take about a minute. Class? Yes. Very good. What are the response rate? <laughs> You're quick learners. Thank you. So would anyone like to share their definition as far as they've got in that period of time with the class? And before you make a comment in this class, this is our first day in class, boys and girls, you can preface your comments with your name. Okay. Sarah. Sarah. Um, to me, what makes what was the exact question? Just define there. teaching. Define, define teaching. teaching. Okay. Someone who is, can I define teacher? No, teaching. Uh, teaching. You want to come back to you? No. Okay. I think that's kind of the same answer. Okay. Um, teaching is a profession. Um, you need to be prepared. I feel like I'm answering the teacher question. Um, but no, teaching. You need to be prepared, flexible, caring and a communicator with parents and students. So that caring, flexible, professional person, what does she do? She's giving over knowledge. Ah, so that's your definition of teaching. Giving over knowledge. Sarah, um, facilit a teacher is a teaching, facilit facilitating a child's learning. Facilitating a child's learning. Yes. What does that mean? Um, like giving them I can't put my hands around that. I mean, you know, what does it mean, like, tachlis what? Helping them to learn. Them helping them to learn. Okay. So giving over information, helping them to learn. Jessica, I wrote that a teacher plays many roles, um, but a central role would be imparting knowledge and also encouraging a student to higher levels of thinking. Okay. So imparting knowledge is the first part of what Sarah said, right? Giving over information. Uh, and, and, and Sarah mentioned the notion of learning to tie to that, and now you talk about the dispositions. Right, so we have three different ideas here, right? Good. Uh, conveying information. Good. Tell them your oh, name. Oh, sorry, sure. okay. uh, conveying information in a, mad, in a manner that students understand and retain that information. Okay, so is, is there any case you said uh, based on what you heard the three people say? Okay, well, uh, uh, Sarah, uh, did you have it retained in mind when you thought about learning? What does learning mean to you? Is um, it retained? I didn't, I didn't find it. I mean, it was, to me, it was implied, but I didn't okay. say it. Anyone have, have an, anything that was not said that they want to say about what teaching is? Um, I think it's also... Your name is? Uh, Annie. Mm -hmm. I'm Annie. Um, teaching is also the ability to inspire and, um, and, that, and give over self-confidence and invigorate and allow students to know that they can do more and that all, there's always more to learn. And the last, uh, please. Teaching is also name, oh, Ariel. Um, I think teaching is not only just imparting information, but it's also imparting um, skills as well for the kids to be able to learn on their own later on, as well as um, um, explaining. Uh, also, teaching is not only just teaching information that we get, you know, social studies and the like, but also a way of living life. Good. Daniel, the only thing I would want to add to what people are saying about conveying information or skills is that it's, uh, it's being conveyed to them in, in a manner that's tailored for people to understand it. Okay. Which means they have to learn. Um, well, I don't necessarily know that if people don't learn from what you teach them, you didn't teach it. In definition wise, you may not be a good teacher, but, but, from, but I would say there's an intent for them to learn. Okay. So, so, so they call me a professor, not a teacher. Mm -hmm. You know why? Mm -hmm. I profess what you said is wrong. 
I profess, I would posit, that you are not a teacher unless each of the components that you mentioned are included. That when you're involved in the process of communicating, of talking, and you're not making sure students have learned, then it's not teaching. There's a process of an education going on, but teaching is a very particular process that by definition necessitates that students have learned. Let me ask you a question. You're all going to shul and the, and the, and the rough gives a drasha on Shabbos. Is he teaching? Is he a teacher? I would say no. I would say no, he's not teaching. He's lecturing. <clears throat> Unless he checks for understanding and checks to see that when you walked out of that room, you understood and know and learn what was said. I walked out of many drushos and, and yeah, I, but my, my love spoke about Parshas this week and I, if you ask me to say, say well, what, what he said, I really don't remember anymore actually. You know, I, I listened for 20 minutes though. Well, it, was, it was good. But more, more than that, I can't remember. It was, I, he never checked my understanding more than I saw that as a learning, you know, I was, I was a good for it. Um, so I would say to you that 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 when someone lectures, when a gives a, gives a shear, and they read over the Gemara, they read over Tosses to you, you listen, and he says, "Are there any questions?" I went, I went to a shear, and, and the rough said as follows: He said, "I'm giving you this Gemara shear, and I don't want this to be a monologue. I want you to ask questions." He then spoke for forty-five minutes. No one asked questions. And he said, are there any questions? No questions. Next 40 minutes, he continued. At the end, any questions? Was he, was he teaching? No. Was he, was he a teacher? No. You know what? By definition of teach, teaching to occur, the teacher who's giving you all the information, so to speak, has to check for understanding. It is. It is it possible students are learning? Yeah, it's possible. Sure, it's possible. But unless you check for, unless you know, then it's not teaching by definition. It's lecturing. It's, it's it's giving over whatever. It's conveying information. It's transmitting knowledge. You know. In Yeshayahu Paraklami Pasachov, it says, "Be'inacha rose esma esma recha." Your eye, your eye should see your teacher. I could be easily done done this by. Uh, is there a loudspeaker here? Mm -hmm. It's one of those things in the corner of my office. I can just talk to you. Would I be teaching? Unless I somehow miraculously be able to check for your understanding by looking at your body language and seeing you, know, seeing you, you know, and, and, and posing questions and checking for understanding in various ways, I don't think so. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be conveying information, but not knowing whether it was received or not. So that's why I profess. In, in my defense, I just wanted to say that I thought you were asking for what the common medical perceived the definition to be. Oh, I didn't know you were asking. I didn't mean to put, you know, take it personal. I, 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 <laughs> just, uh, I, I try to be provocative at your expense, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, and so when you look at most classrooms, elementary school, kindergarten, lots of lecturing going on, lots of we call this the process of recitation, where someone speaks and students just listen passively. It happens in college, a lot. Majority. Majority. <laughs> they, have, they, they have no idea, you know. They're getting, they're, they're getting over information. They can determine a final, a paper. You can ask a question, book, a book, a drink, class, maybe. That's it. It's not teaching. They're professors. They're professing their, their, their knowledge. A teacher, the key ingredient there is besides all that you said, is also um, giving over information in a way that's understandable to the child's learning style, takes into consideration the child's learning needs, accommodates the content and matches it to the child's developmental level, and the, the, the teacher checks for understanding. It's a process we call assessment. Assessment, all essentially is, is checking for understanding in various ways. It's not just giving a test at the end of the unit. As you take, if some of you may be taking an assessment course this summer, you'll know that, you'll learn that assessment is called formative assessment as well. As you proceed, check for understanding. 
So therefore, we're at, the definition of teaching has to include, obviously, conveying information, but in an interactive way, where the student is involved in the lesson, engaged in the lesson, not just being passive recipients, but involved, engaged, and with a teacher check for understanding, and all the other things you said, of course, all the dispositional ideas you mentioned, that, that, that uh, you mentioned, Jessica, that was, um, are very much part of the teaching process. To get good at that takes practice, takes a mentor, takes a mentor. What we have here is new teachers' research has failed because of the isolation, the lack of support. Uh, sometimes we tell principals, don't give them the toughest assignments. You know, sometimes new teachers are giving the problem kids because there are more tenured teachers in the school that don't want them. Bad move to make for a new <laughs> teacher. Uh, you need to ask your supervisors and mentors how you're going to be evaluated. Your mentor doesn't evaluate you. Your mentor should not be the principal, ideally. should be a fellow teacher, a more experienced teacher who wants to be a mentor, who himself or herself is an excellent teacher. Not the best, but knows pedagogy. <clears throat> is able to communicate, convey that information. But who's going to evaluate you? The protege is there for your, uh, the, the mentor is there as your partner. You have a fear, you want help, you go to the mentor. And you have confidence and trust that mentor won't go and run to the principal that ah, she doesn't know what she's talking about. That that breaks the relationship. So we're going to tell the mentors tomorrow. They have to they have to really cherish that, that relationship between, you know, with, with, with the proteges. It's the principal, the vice principal, whomever evaluates you. It's the mentor who really works and helps you. Okay. Uh, teachers stay up with those classroom management issues. You could, you could love the subject, love the, love the content, love to teach, but if you can't deal with classroom management, you have that book, First Days of School, you know, for, by Wong, they gave it out, First Days of School by Wong, Harry Wong. Oh, oh, I like Wong. Yeah. Oh, okay. Read the book. I don't care what grade you teach. Establish a system of discipline day one and keep to it. How many of you are going to write lesson plans? How many of you have an idea of how you're going to instill discipline or classroom management? Have a plan for it. It's more important than the lesson plan. What do you need? What do you want? What are the rules you're going to have? How do you give out paper? How do you give out paper? That can cause discipline problems. If you give out a wrong, if you do it wrong, you know, handing it out this way, pass it back, is the worst thing to do. Kids, you know tisk somebody in the head by accident, you know, paper cuts. There's a chachman, how to get out papers. We call those procedures. How you want folks about procedures, how to get out, how to line up. How to line up, you know. And you practice these things. What rules? Are you going to have a whole bunch of don'ts? Who's going to make the rules, you or them? What's the answer? You together. You? No. Both. You want to involve third graders and 12th graders in rule making. So it's our rules, we've, we've, we've come to agree upon. And you're gonna spend the first two weeks teaching the rules like you teach a math lesson. You teach the rules and you train them. No, let me change that. You never train them, you never train them. You train animals, you educate people, Professor. Davis told me that many years ago. You're going to, you're going to educate them and on, what, on what the rules are. You're going to practice getting papers out. You're going to practice a lineup. Whatever procedures and rules you establish, you're going to re rehearse it. There's a great book. In fact, I think everyone, I, this should, I would recommend this be a book you get, you get next year. If you, if you have some money to buy a book, Lee Cantor, Assertive Discipline. To my mind, the best book on classroom management. In particular, now, people love him or hate him. There's nobody in the middle. He's particularly good for upper elementary through, through, through 12th grade. Some people in the lower grades feel he's too harsh. He believes in setting up rules and consequences with students. If you do this and you break this rule, you get that. And it's, this should be progressive consequences, meaning if the rule is you don't leave the classroom without permission, 
and they do, there are four levels. You break, the first time you break it, maybe a warning. Get back to your seat, and it's a warning next to your name. Second time, it might be uh, five minutes after class with you. Third time, it might be ten minutes of recess off. Fourth time, maybe a parent called, and it gets progressively harsher. And when we get to one level, and a kid begs me, please don't call my parent. Please, okay? Let's say you, I, you know, I acted out, and you have to call my parent, okay? And I say to you, what grade is it? What grade is it? Sixth grade. Please don't call my daddy. Please don't call. Okay, I'll, I'll be good tomorrow. Okay? There you guys. Yeah, yeah, you're the teacher. Um, I'm glad you're going to get tomorrow, but yeah. I'm still going to have to call your parents. It's the first time I was, I was ever bad. Oh. Please don't. My, they're going to beat me. Please don't. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> give, give, give me one. Give me, give me one so day. Sure. Give me, give me one day. <laughs> one day to be good. If I'm there tomorrow, call my parent. Okay? I would say no. I mean, if, if, you, if you had set up a rule that if they're bad, you call their parents. But I you know. most of you wouldn't be as strong. Most, most, most people. I wouldn't. Have, I wanted, I wasn't strong the first time. The kid, the kid pleaded with me. Give him a chance. I, I'll call him tomorrow. He said he gets beaten. I, I, I like him some slack. But, uh, well, I, just, I, I used to like, you know, I saw you weren't going, so I, 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 I threw that in, hoping that you would uh, came in, but I, you didn't came in. I had a friend who actually, who actually said that, but he was serious. Yeah. So that, so well, that, well, that case, you have to really consider well, that's, 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 that's a great flavor. <coughs> Consulting the vice principal about that possibility of happening. But um, Cantor says, you say you're going to do something, you do it. Because they may not, not like you, not their job is not to like you. The job is to them to learn. What's controversial about that? It's harsh, they say. It's really harsh. It's harsh. I, like, Jessica substituted for my class before. Like, can you imagine, like, telling a five-year-old, like, I don't know, it's really hard. Like, I've given consequences before, and a kid broke down, crying, hysterically, and I caved in. It's, I know it's the worst five thing year, in the world. Well, Five-year-olds are, are a little different oh, than the fifth worst. grade. Oh, uh, it's the worst. Terrible. Um, right. And if one kid, I just, we had a contest in the seventh grade in my school, we went through, I think, six teachers in one year for the same subject, and the contest was how, once we got past the third, it was how many could we go through, and kids will walk all over you if you, if you don't set up rules, and you don't have to be mean, you have to be firm. You know how you said earlier, just a little bit ago, that you're both, that you both make the rules? So how do you come into class um, the first day of school if you have to get to know your students, if you have to know what works for them, how do you do that? So uh, Wong talks about that in his book. But he said, boys and girls, you know, uh, we have to have some rules. And there are things that I want and need. And I'm sure you're here to learn. And we're going to make these rules together. So what are some of the things, I guess, I don't know what we're, we're talking to. In high school, I talk differently than I would talk to the first graders. But, uh, and, the, and the nature of involvement is obviously more sophisticated with upper graders than, than lower graders. And you have to use your judgment. But I will going to start the first day and uh, say, here, here are three of my rules. Come up with three rules. And always, I think, state them in the positive. Not don't run, but we walk to our learning corners or whatever we you know in a positive way. And, and here are the three things, that these, three, these three things, before we, before we respond, before we, you know, we raise our hand. We always raise our hand. Uh, we keep our hands and to ourselves, and we don't, you know, get some money, that kind of, whatever it is. Uh, and then you, then you ask them, is there anything I left out? Is there, is there a rule that you want to see? Uh, that's maybe a smaller out eighth grader might say, yeah, we can leave whatever we want to. Mm. Well, yeah, is that really realistic? You know, class, what do you think? Mm. And discuss it. And obviously, you know. Um, and then, actually, if they just put in one rule, it becomes not your rules, it becomes our rules. And then you, then you actually have a form, depending on how old they are, have a formal vote on them. It becomes, and it's posted. It's written on a sheet of paper for, on the next day. It's given to their parents. And I actually, ever, actually, they would sign it. You would sign it. And the parents would sign it. Okay? And it's this clear communication of what the expectations are for behavior in the classroom. And then you practice them. And I would say, can someone volunteer to break, break rule number two by like getting out of seat permission? Okay? So, anything. So, you know, let's say, you know, a uh, guy got out of the seat. You did that so well. You know, I did that so well. You broke the rule. Now, let's practice the right way, way to do it. Okay? And then you reinforce that. So, teach, spend time teaching.
Um, Allison, can you add rules as the year progresses? Yes, but the rules should not be more, I would say, more than, uh, than six rules, four, four to six rules. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you chose them right in the beginning, I'm gonna give some, I'm gonna give some handouts that will, uh, this part of the instructional tips part of the class, uh, that will help you, will guide you towards developing your, your, your rules. They'll post questions about what your needs are. What do you need? For example, I don't want if kids get out of their seat in my class. I don't care kids eating in my class. I, don't, I say kids, college kids. <laughs> but, and obviously your rules have to be in consonance with your school rules. Now I taught 12th grade, I allowed the kids in my class. I asked the principal, hey, said, whatever, you, whatever works for you. I had no problem with it. As long as they were on task, I had no problem with it. Um, and uh, so my need was, I mean, some kids can't sit for long periods of time. They want to stand, they want to walk around the room. They want to stand being disruptive, I have no problem with that. They want to scribble, I don't care what they you know. They want to draw, they want to stay attentive. You know, you, and kids can be attentive while, they, while they're drawing. They don't have to do that all the time, mm -hmm. unless I say the magic word. So, uh, what do you need? What do you want? And then develop a plan. We'll talk more about that. Um, poor time management. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, slide five, eleven. Mentoring. Let's move ahead to uh, part that relates to you. These are for the mentors tomorrow. Okay, we have several phases of the mentoring process. So, um, Number three, what do each of you bring to the table? You know, what does your mentor bring to the table? What do you bring to the table in terms of your own experience? Just because you're beginning this program doesn't mean you have no have had no experience. You may have some experience. Okay? In order for this to work, your schools are told to follow in terms of time for availability. You are released once a week to observe and or speak to your mentor. Your mentor is to be released and observed once a week to observe and meet with you. Ideally, it should be as follows. You're released one, one period a week, okay? They're released, uh, and that one period, one period could be to observe the mentor, or which you should observe her or him teach, and then have time to discuss it. Now, due to some school restraints, sometimes they can't release three times, three times in a week. Ideally, it's you're released once, they're released once, and then you're both released at the same time. So what some schools do is, you're released as the protege, they're released as the mentor, and then they use like lunchtime or like five minutes six, or, or, or ten minutes somewhere in the day where you're both free. But what we tell the principals, you should really try to release both of them at the same time for them to have a, a, a prolonged conversation about what's happening in the classroom. So after he observes you or she observes you, you, you discuss it. And same thing when you observe her, uh, that time is very important. Okay, so that, that makes, we gotta make sure that that's happening. Whoever is assigned to you, whichever professor, is going to make sure that your, your principal, and I'm actually speaking to all the principals, I'm going to reinforce this with them as well, that that's, this program cannot work unless it happens. Okay? Um, building relationship is very important with your mentor. You've got to get along with the person. You don't have to be the best friends and go out to drink afterwards, right? But it means that you have to respect the person, they have to respect you. And that, and that there's open communication, there's feedback. Take, take the first month just to know each other, each other's styles and all that, because you're like, see, it's like a, it's a, a, the only, the only, the only shotgun was the principal who designated the mentor, without knowing you. So, and in all our cases last year, almost all our cases worked out beautifully, you know. Uh, and hopefully that would be the same, but you never, you never know. My rule is to make sure that the process is, is kosher and everything's working well. Um, you're going to share your bit on Wednesday. You're going to share your goals with each other. It's 
best, as best you can with you together with your, with your mentors on Wednesday, I said, Wednesday, you're going to get together. And you may not develop a plan this, this week, but because you don't know your school yet, your classroom yet, really, somewhere in the first month or so, you should develop some, some year-long goals with, for yourself that the mentor will help you, help you with. You might be developing a classroom management plan, you might be helping with teaching content, you might be helping dealing with uh, some behavior problems, whatever it is, and developing some, some goals that you can actually assess at the end of the year. So the mentor does not need to hold your hand. You're the teacher of record, okay? They're there to help you, assist you, but you're going to be on your own. They're not evaluative, they're not insisting, they're not, they're not telling you what to do. They may suggest certain things, but they're, they're, they're real, their goal is to really get you on your own two feet. And the way you get somebody on their own two feet is not by telling them, but by facilitating and by guiding them and encouraging them. And sometimes it might not be, you know, you, you may want to know, well, how was my lesson? And they may say to you, well, how do you think it was? That could be very annoying. You want to have, you know, what, you know, but the reason for that is, they want you to think, be, be, become, begin to think on your own two feet. Well, first we hear what you say, and then, I'll, then we'll talk about some possibilities, you know, ways of doing things differently. Or I might pose a question, you taught, if you, I, I use this all the time, if you taught that lesson again, how would you do it differently? And what does that question encourage? To assess your own, to assess what you did. The mentor won't be there all the time. The supervisor won't be there all the time. You'll be all there in the room yourself. You'll become what's called a reflective practitioner. And and by if someone always tells you what's right or wrong, you won't stand your own two feet. And in the beginning, you may like that. After a while, it's not in your best interest. I'm going to say that you know, there are times you can say, you know, I'm coming in today, and here are the three things I think you should work on, and let's discuss it. That's okay, but not all the time. Then when I ask you your methods this question, do you want to answer to that? What is expected of you? What do they, they expect of you? You know? What do they tell you? I mean, I think they were down to the last detail. It was outlined in my contract. So exactly what I'd be doing, when I'd be doing it, in terms of extracurriculars, in terms of actual day-to-day basis uh, before school actually starts and they still going to be there and for davening you know, and... Sure. What about the bottom line? No, not at all. They should. The second bullet, I'm not sure, because Judaic subjects in Jewish schools obviously are almost non-existent. Curriculum in Jewish subjects. Which is the problem we're working on with, with schools. Your responsibilities. It seems obvious, but believe me, when you're in the when you're when you're starting with the complexity of, uh, of the job, it's good to re- review these. You should have gotten a you should have gotten a copy of the PowerPoint. If not, and if you're not, I'll send it to you. I'll email it. I'll email it to you, or Joey was supposed to give it out, or, have, or, or make copies for everybody. Okay. If you don't get it by the end of the week, let me know, and I'll be happy to email it to you. Okay. Thank you. We're going to ask you to evaluate your mentor, privately, anonymously. Each of these are critical to your success. Any comments or questions? The mentor should be an advocate for you. By the way, if you're not good, it should be a counselor for you, a counselor you're out of your teaching. <laughs> The 
Building that trust, you know, is, is key. You gotta trust you, you gotta trust them. That's what part of the relationship building process. Okay. And these are the roles of, you know, of the supervisor, which you see, you know, they have to actually, they're committed to, to helping you. They provide the, the, the context and set goals and so forth and so on. So I think that, that's the end of the PowerPoint. Now, instructional tips, okay? So I'm going to give this to you. This is something I put together many years ago, okay? So ignore the cover and the location, but in this, it's, 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 I gave, a, I gave a, 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 work, a series of workshops on classroom management. It's one of my areas of specialization. And um, there are a couple of questions I wanna, I wanna point you to. This one's called my, my ideal classroom. And it, it lists a number of, of, of activities, okay? And then it says, this is essential to my classroom, this is not important to me, this may be important to me, etc. And for example, the desks must be in neat ordered rows. Is that important to you? Is that essential to you? There's a difference. Essential means it must be important. It might be not essential, but it's important, or it might be not at all. So answering these questions will help you will help you think about what your own needs are and and desires are in the classroom, so that you, you can then develop a discipline system that, that that's suited to your needs, so that your system matches what what, what you want. Okay, a couple, a couple of articles here. Okay, there are three stages of discipline. The first one is like medicine, preventive medicine, preventive discipline. If you do these things in the beginning of the year, as Harry Wong in his book will tell you. That's preventive medicine. That's preventive discipline. Because once, if you've not, if you don't have, as one of one of our purges last year did not develop a plan, and by the end of the year, by the middle, but by the, by the second month, it was half developed, you know, in, in the classroom because inconsistencies are very, very, you know, are, are paramount. And she said one thing to one kid, and then the kid did the same exact thing, and and didn't punish him, or punish him more severely. I throw him paper in the waste paper basket. You know, I'm calling your mother. And then she did it and didn't, she didn't say, didn't say anything. You know? It wasn't not, not that she didn't even see it. She saw it. And, and we asked, it, it, she was so busy with teaching the lesson, she didn't. So that's why it's important to, to work on your discipline, your preventive discipline, so that um, you'll be able to um, be corrective uh, if the case needs to be. So there's, there's, a, there's an article here on actually how to develop, a very short one article, a two-page article, how to develop your own discipline plan, okay? I'm a big believer, no matter what age, on contracts. Kids will act out in the classroom because of peer pressure, no matter how, how old they are, okay? Never take anything personally. If a kid calls you a name or saying, you'll do homework, he says, I'm not doing the homework. It's a red flag that this kid has, has, has problems. Has social, has, has, has personal problems. He's a problem that that he uh, has a lack of confidence in himself. He needs the attention, and you see that you have sympathy for him, or, or rather empathy, and you don't confront him. We'll talk about it later, okay? And you move on. Uh, just one second. Um, Lee Cantor has what he calls the broken record technique. Uh, Chaim, uh, please go back to your seat. Chaim, go back to your seat. I understand that you need to sharpen your pencil, but right now I want you to go back to your seat. Yeah. We'll do it later. Go back to your seat. The broken record technique. You say it assertively, and and, and if this is one of the rules that we don't get a seat without permission, whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. Do you consider that kind of um, disruptive behavior to be a sign of something, some problem, or, or just normal kids acting like kids? You said you said about a sign of a problem. Yeah, someone who's def defiant in, in that way is indicative it, it is indicative of something. What's going on there, socially or psychologically? You know, that's the, it, but but you obviously you're not a psychologist, you're not a sociologist, so you can't unless you know the, the family, the person's background, you can't make that judgment. But the point was not to take a not not, not to take it personally, not to confront the person. Okay, it's not against you; it's the issues with them, not you. Um, so I'm a big believer in contracts. The kids who are the most hardened kids of, in a group. Will, will, well, like melt in your hand, so to speak, one-on-one. -on -one. 
So I believe in big meeting with kids one on one and giving them a contract that, and actually, you know, some kids have actually have, have discipline cards for the severe, more severe cases where you actually write down how they did the end of the class and their parent signs at the end. And the next day, you see, you, know, you, you you look at it. Yeah. I had that this year. I had a really difficult child. Um, actually, was going to comment my most behaviorally most difficult child. The parents told me they're like, we're so busy, we don't like. Or they would say, like, I feel so bad. I don't have enough time to give him any attention. And that's for sure why he was acting. I mean, I think part of it is his personality. I think he's just like a funny comedian type of a kid. But I think part of it is because he didn't get so much attention at home. Unfortunately, they're great people. Just, um, but in, I was just going to say something. Contract. Oh, contract. So we sat down with him, his father, and his English teacher. The the four of us sat down together. Um, and we decided we were going to make a behavior chart for him because he was like really misbehaving. And he helped us make it. We're like, okay, we're the two things we're going to work on. And he told us the two things that he wants to work on. And at the end of every day, we would he would actually circle the number that he thought he deserved, and it would get sent home every day. I would sign it, and it would get sent home, and parent would send it back. And it really helped him. It really helped him. Really helped him. And the things for like younger kids here as well. Because obviously mm -hmm. some things don't really work, this one will work, you know, the you know, stars out to uh, to twelfth graders, <laughs> and there's some past some some, some really, uh, you know, uh, cute tidbits in terms of uh, free time pass or good behavior, rewarding them for good behavior. There's whole machlokas in the field about mm -hmm. using positive reinforcement. There's a, a person you're going to read in the, in the field called Alfie Cohn. Anybody ever heard Alfie Cohn? He wrote a book called Punished by Rewards. Mm -hmm. How we fail, ki fail kids by, by offering reinforcements. His thing is you know, develop intrinsic motivation. The Rambam says we know we give rewards. We give rewards. Even the belts need cover. They may not need the candies anymore, but it's, you know. But the, the goal is to build intrinsic. You know. Uh, um, but Alfie Cohen has a very interesting sheet of his, his website, Alfie Cohen, K O H N, Alfie A L F I E. Interesting sheet on. But I'm a big believer in in proper use of uh, of reinforcements. Uh, until his children are able to internalize uh, the strategies on their own. So there's a whole bunch of, 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 of suggestions in here. And um, there's actually, and I also want to give you a sample, a sample uh, plan, classroom management plan, how a uh, one of my students, Rachel Schwab, Rachel Schwab, actually developed this plan, uh, it, comes, it starts with her belief system, what she believes in, in terms of her education, her needs, my needs, and then uh, her rules, you see some example of rules, the consequences of the rules, and uh, she has both actually positive consequences and negative consequences, you'll see. And then she has uh, preventive discipline, what to do during preventive discipline. Second stage is supportive discipline. Supportive means just when the when the when the problem just begins to act out, begins to happen, as opposed to third step, stage where it's all fully blown blown out. What do you do then? In the real severe situation, it's called correct, corrective discipline. You have preventive, supportive, and corrective, and it'll be really clear. Um, and in the end, I provided for you a rubric for assessing your own ability to deal with classroom management issues in the classroom. Okay. So, you know, in thinking of all the instructional tips I can give in a short period of time, I think classroom management is, is the number one thing on many people's teachers' minds. And many, many of you have had a class in this last semester, last year, perhaps. Um, and some of you will have, we'll talk about uh, this. How many take, you taking models one this semester, models two? Then that will be part of the, of the class um, as well. Okay? So, I've got to give this out. So how, how should I give these out? <laughs> What's my procedure? <laughs> so there are various ways of, uh, of giving it out. You can have, uh, I'm a big believer in especially the younger grades of monitors, is one way. There's another way that's controversial that I'm going to share with you. It's in the book, it's in the, one of the books you've got, Teaching, do uh, you, you have the books with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, one of the, it's one of the books, okay? I'm going to try it. <laughs> It's going to work really well because it's a small class. But imagine we have we have uh, 25 kids in the class. Okay? Wait to hear this. You're going to have 25 seconds <laughs> to get a copy of each of the handouts. 
Now, there's no prize for first place, second place, but I want to see that everyone will get a copy of each of the handouts in 25 seconds. I'm going to count out loud so that you know that, okay? 20, 20 seconds. 20 seconds, okay? 20 seconds. Now, I'm going to model for you how to do that, boys and girls, okay? So, when I say, when I say, um, snowflake for young grades, if I say, uh, challenge for upper grades, what a keyword I use, you're going to, that means, get your hand out, okay? So somebody say one of those words? Challenge. Okay? And some of the, so you, you count that out and go one one thousand two one thousand go ahead. one one thousand two one thousand three one thousand four one thousand five one thousand eight one thousand nine one thousand ten one thousand eleven one thousand twelve one thousand thirteen one thousand fourteen one thousand I'll give you a prize for your back end. Okay, and now you're going to reinforce that. How look how you'll say look how nicely you did that. And now, then we act out the wrong way of doing it. You know, then run, running <laughs> and, and knocking the chair down, all that. And, and, and then having a laugh about it. That's one of the suggestions in the book. Okay? So. What's the advantage of that method? What's that? What's the advantage? It gives them, it gives them out of their seats. It gives them out of their seats. It's fun. And by the way, they say, uh, they say that, that, um, it's not, there's not, you don't, you don't have to employ the same method uh, each time. Mm -hmm. I actually think that would work really well with um, younger kids. Mm -hmm. Actually, he recommends for high school. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll see in the book. What if your class is going to be as big as four kids? <laughs> I'm sorry. Everything we've done oh. since we last did it. Review everything we've done. Ready? Go, okay. teach. Okay. Oh, okay. Hey. Go, go, okay. Hey. Three of you, three of you. Oh. Loud. Wow, teach. we just heard so much. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. That it takes yeah. the practice of yeah. leadership. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
there any questions? For what we've discussed. What I'd like you to do, we have uh, just a few moments left. What I'd like you to do is uh, turn to your partner again and take an idea that we that we went over today, any one thing, and discuss how you could use it in your class. You all know what grades you're going to have, what grades? Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, uh, discuss one, one strategy, one technique that uh, you could use with your class and how you would do that. And, and what you we can do is this. The three of you, well, oh, let's do my grade level. Maybe my grade level. Oh, there's six levels. In my fifth, six, six seven? Yeah. How about both of you? Gentlemen, come on the side. What grade are you? 9, 10, 11, 12. Anybody 9, 10, 11, 12? Yeah. Okay, would you please go over there? Oh, perfect. Okay. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay, and, and what? Three of you? Three. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, go. Cool. Cool. So it looks like it's a triangle, but really it's a triangle. Yeah. Right. Anyway. So what do you think? Right. And how do you think about it? It's like, wow. And it was like, weird. I'm not used to treating it like that. I did. And it's like, here's what I'm thinking. So I think this girl. Let's just all agree that it's going to be exactly. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm going to go back to the doctor. I'm going to go back to the doctor. I'm quite nervous because they're hesitating. I mean, I think also you can have like three weeks. We should only be able to have. I'm not. 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 I'm that's what I'm saying. Really? Yeah. No, no, no one would, like, yeah, it would be like any other gold star. I wonder if I can work that in just for kicks in the air. But that's No, I'm saying, like, you could technically, by saying, like, if you, I mean, I think the contract. Class? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're at the end now, and um, if 
this no need if you want to have difficulty with any of these and want to, I guess among, among yourselves you can share. And if you want to know the answer, if you can't, if any of you can't figure out any of them, just let me know. I'll be happy to help you. Yeah, but you do the dots. Yeah, you do the dots. No, the ones with the arrows. Does anybody can do the, anybody can do the dots? Wait, I'm, I'm confused. What do you mean by consecutive? Three lines. You don't take three lines. lines. You have to take the pen off the paper. Yeah. Three lines? Straight lines. Three straight lines? Three straight lines. You want more time for that or you want me to tell you now? Wait, can you oh, with all yeah. of this? Who wants more time to figure it out on their own for tomorrow or next week? I think day? I can do the lines eventually. And they all have to be connected? The dots yeah. all have to be connected? Okay, so you want, those, who, those who want to know, I'll do it here. You know why you have difficulty? It's the same reason I have difficulty with it. First no, because then these two dots. No, I know and you is, When you see those nine dots, what comes to your mind? Can't go outside. Three rows. Right. But you can't do this. You, in your mind, have a structure of three rows. Does this mean? Can you go like So I go like this. Watch. One, two, three. Does that do it? No. That's missing, right? So two dots. Yeah. Okay, so I'll make this. One, two, three. <laughs> Doesn't do it. Yeah. What do I do? Ah, I know. Think out of the box. Yeah. Think out of the box. Think out of the box. Think out of the box. This is the box. We're thinking in the box. Is that a hint? Yeah, but I still can't get it. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Can you give me one second? Well, yes. Think out of the box. Hold on. No, we, no, we can't really manage the dots. But huh? think out of the box. I can't what? You can't rearrange the, the, the dots. No, you can't no. rearrange the dots. Advanced and funny as you're looking for, but you think if you do it at an angle, you can go past the box. And, that's, that's, the, it. That is the that's, it. that's the answer. No. You got it? I still can't get it. No, but still. You need to have space. Okay. Well, that's Hold on, hold on, hold on. It needs to, it needs to be smaller, you can do it. Because it needs to be at an angle. You're trying to hit multiple with one line? So you just did four. That's four. Four, four lines. Four lines. But you're saying go past it to the point where when you go diagonally, it'll hit them all? Yeah, that's three? what I'm saying. Oh, well, if you like would have told me I had four lines. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so, was that Z? Yeah, because if, if you do it. Oh, like this. Oh, hold on. Small enough. One. Oh, hold on. You're saying this. Yeah. But they're not all. What do you mean by they're not all? Then does that count as being all connected? Where do you go to? Where, where no, do you go to? So work. then why can't you just go like this then? Cheating. No, that's less more. Oh, that's because you're saying that it's how, diagonal. How, right. How, so how, how do you go? Show me how to do this. It, it's not at a 180 degree angle, it's at a slight angle. You have to assume that the points are in one Can you do it for us? Okay, sure. Yeah. Me the old lady for like 10 minutes, and I, <laughs> I did not see that. Thing. You only see the lady. I can see any lady. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you assume that the points are in two, are one thing, they're two dimensionals. They have some sort of thickness to them. All right, come on, this isn't a math. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, changing the okay, changing the problem a little bit. Change the problem a little bit, but I, yeah, then the Z works. That's really right. thinking outside. Yeah, the, the Z works because you can have right. an angle of the line, you can go through all three of these points. That's not a straight line. It's a straight line if you look at it like this. And if I'm sorry, okay, if I have a ruler, I can make it through okay, each of these. He's not going perfectly right, yeah, but, yeah. And then through each of these, and then through each of these. If, if, if he had them. a ruler, like, that if he had a ruler, I could have done okay, it. Okay, so my instructions, four lines, four lines. But, say, but the same yeah. principle is, when you see the dots, you think in right. the box. This is out of the box. And there's research on this that says that right brain thinkers, uh, I mean, truly right brain thinkers, naturally think out of the box and, and, and solve this much more readily than left brain thinkers. People who are generally initially think in the box. What's the arrow? What about these two? There's not a correlation between the two. Yeah. Although, there are more right brain thinkers than there are left handers that are right brain thinkers. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. What about the, yeah. the arrows? Oh, it no, says no, fly no. and win. Yeah. Can I see it? Fly. Um, 
my gosh. Now I, I would never have seen it. I would have been so oh, funny. How many oh, Fs did you see? Seven. I saw five. Okay. Seven. One, seven. I saw three at first. <laughs> three, four, you five. Remember the word, the word I know, I forgot that one. The that is five. Six, seven. Where's seven? There are three ofs in, in, in People it. forget, people five. overlook the ofs, the small, small things. things. Oh, oh. Don't, don't oh. overlook the small kids in the class. The kids who were quiet in the back. That wasn't fair. That, that last oh. F was fading. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Shkola, take care. It wasn't enough. Uh, you're right. Look, what? You're right. It wasn't enough. Yeah. The last thing. So, it was? Okay. Oh, no, just another of. Oh, man. Oh, man. Are the Dr. Nahar mentioned your class? Is that are those like like vocal? So that those ideas are not my own. They come from the book that you that that you're going to have. And there's only two. There's many more. Cool. So and it works. It works in some classes. It doesn't work in others. You have to figure out. I would just imagine know, that, like, like by the end of the year, it starts like. I don't think so. Fading you, out. you have to feel comfortable with it, right? You know, as a teacher, right? Yeah. But then you may change them. Right. Change the word. Change yeah. the process. You know. Yeah. Right. The thing is, once you get your attention, then you have to say it anymore. Right. The thing is, get your attention. Right. Sure. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're free till 5.30? Yeah. We're really free till 7.30, actually. It's just dinner at 5.30. You think we'll be a little busy? And where do we go for dinner? Here? I think they're giving us. I think giving said, um, right. one here? No, I think it's maybe down. It's in Belfort. Um, the second floor? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is this Belfort Hall? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, no. Might be the one who was really annoyed at the whole class thing. What? Class? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I wasn't annoyed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 It's like silly. Like, you know, it's silly, but it works. It does the point. <laughs> <laughs>